Hello, gorgeous. Welcome to HG Radio, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration. Here is your co-founder and host, Kim Becker. Hello, gorgeous, and thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Kim Becker, and this is Hello, Gorgeous, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration on Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and soul. This episode is brought to you by Amplified Marketing Group. They specialize in affordable mobile solutions that will get you noticed and help you retain customers. Check them out at www.amplified.marketing. Hello, my friends. I wanted to do an episode today on uh, an experience that I never thought that I would have, um, but I am in this position now. I, again, I never thought I would be here, but I'd like to talk to you today about parenting solo. Um, three years ago, I became a widow with a 15-year-old son, and I have learned a lot So I thought that this would be a great episode to share with you the three things that I have found that have helped me be a successful solo parent. Um, You know, we deal with a lot of women that are battling cancer. Many women uh, are unsure of what their, um, of what their fate will be. Their loved ones that are taking care of them, a spouse may not know what their fate, the, the loved one that was diagnosed with cancer, what their fate will be. And so um, it's, it's not easy, but it can be done. And I feel like my son and I have uh, weathered the storm and have journeyed through this quite well. So I wanted to share a little bit of my story and some of the things that we've done to, um, to uh, what I feel to be a successful solo parent. So years ago, Somebody gave me a piece of advice, and I I still think about it to this day. I Mike and I may have been engaged. So uh, actually, last week, we would have celebrated 27 years of marriage. So this, I bet, I may have gotten this vi- advice 30 years ago, but I've never, ever, ever forgotten it. And somebody told me that your child is an open book when they are born, and you're the one that fills the pages. Now, I want you to really think about that. What are you filling your child's pages with? How do you handle unexpected surprises like the loss of a job or a cancer diagnosis or the loss of a parent? If you're caring for an elderly parent, did you ever sit back and think about you caring for an elderly parent and what your children are seeing in in the care that you give your parents, the example that you're setting for them with the hopes that that's how they will care for you. Your child is an open book and you are filling those pages. Really think about that and think about how you're filling those pages because I guarantee you that your children are watching you. They are watching you like a hawk and what better example for them than you. And not only that, the way that you parent them is how they're going to parent their children. So that's the one thing I think I miss about being um, a co- having a co-parent is that Mike and I were kind of yin and yang. I was the one that was very excitable. I'm very passionate. I get very loud. I don't mean to yell sometimes, but I do. And Mike was the one that was very calm. And he, you know, his was, now just wait a minute. Let's think about this. Let's talk about this. His, his was never a reaction. He would make sure that he took pointed actions. And so when I don't have that co-parent now, I have to really play both roles of those. And so I've had to make sure that, and I want my son to, to be more like Mike. I want him to be able to step back. I don't want him to react. I want him to make sure that he really thinks through, you know, here we are in the middle of high school years and, you know, you're faced with different things and, and I don't want him to get upset and emotional, but yet I don't want to tamp down his passion, which he's gotten from me. So I I miss that co-parent where he would get both yin and yang. He would get the passion from me, but he would get um, the sensibility from Mike. And so I've had to kind of take that whole thing on. Uh, And so, but you can, and it's certainly something that can be done. And I think that just having the awareness of it, what traits do you want your child to have of yours? What traits do you you want your child to have of your co-parent who, whether they live with you or not live with you or whether they're deceased. 
so that you can make sure that you accentuate all those positive ones and then tamp down some of the other ones. So funny story that I need to share with you is that when Mike and I got married, we didn't want to have children. We had uh, several discussions at great lengths that we decided that we, we didn't want to have kids. And part of that reason was we didn't know anybody that had children that were happy. Everybody that we knew that had kids seemed miserable. They were yelling at their kids all the time. You want to go, go to the Target toy aisle around Christmas time. If you want a good form of birth control, just stand there and watch how the parents talk to their children or the way that they try and navigate them back. We just, we did not want children, which we are Catholic. And so that caused a little bit of a problem. So we were at the altar and you sign all of the paperwork for the church and for the legal documents actually the night before. So we were signing everything. And for the church, you had to say that you wanted children. And so I'm standing at the altar of the church. I'm not going to lie. So the priest said to us, are you going to have children? And Mike and I looked at each other and we told the priest, no. And he said, you're not going to have children. And we said, no, we don't want to have kids. And, and he asked us why. And we told him we didn't know anybody that had kids that was happy. Everybody that had children looked miserable. And he said to us, you're never going to have children. And I said, well, never is a really long time. I wouldn't say never. And the priest said, okay, well, we're going to mark this one. Yes. And I am so grateful that I am a different, I was a different person at 35 when I had my son than I was at 26 when I got married. Because my son, our son, is the absolute greatest gift that we ever received. He is an incredible individual, and I, my greatest accomplishment of all of the things I've, I've spoken on big public stages. I'm a, um, <laughs> I, I'm an award-winning author. We've had a, an amazing national nonprofit for the last 14 years. But the most proud accomplishment that I have is being the mom to my son. He is absolutely an incredible individual. So Mike and I decided then we were married for nine years. And so we, we started a business and we really wanted to be accomplished. And I was one of those people that I wanted to wait to have kids until I was stable, you know, until I had X amount of money in the bank until I got, I was one of those people. And what they, I, I remember having salon clients come in and say to me, look, if you're going to wait until you have enough money to have a child, you will never have a child because you'll never have enough money. There, there's just no way there are things that are going to come up. There's no way that you can be prepared for that. You will never have enough money. And I we, finally, we were like, okay, so we were married for nine years. And, and quite frankly, then we didn't know if we could have children. Uh, at that point in time, um, Mike was diagnosed with a disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis uh, about three years after we got married. So we had struggled with that. He had had some really high fevers, like 104, 105. So we didn't, we weren't even sure that having children were possible at this point in time. So we decided that we were going to give it a try and that we, we wanted to attempt to get pregnant. So we had tried for a couple of months without success. And we'd, we'd owned a salon at the time. We'd had like seven stylists. And one of our top stylists came to us and said that she was pregnant. And, um, she wasn't married at the time. And so it took us a little aback. It was kind of a surprise to us and to her. And we talked about it and we said, well, there's no way that we can have her out of the salon being our top stylist and me out of the salon being the, the, the top ist <laughs> do the most popular stylist, the most busy stylist, and then have the second busy stylist. We just thought there's no way that our business could handle that. So we decided that we were going to wait until after she got back from maternity leave for us to attempt to, you know, start trying to get pregnant again. And during our time of not trying to get pregnant, we got pregnant. <laughs> and so it's interesting how that happens when you're, when you're not looking, that's when it happens. When you're not trying, that's when it happens. And so uh, we got pregnant. Uh, we found out we were pregnant in October on sweetest day. And um, we told our family at Thanksgiving that we were pregnant. And that's a whole long story for another episode. But our son was born in June, and um, he was absolutely positively the, the greatest gift that we, that we could ever ask for. He was just an amazing child and a great baby, and we knew we only wanted to have one. Part of the reason was because he was so good, we figured that if we had a second child, it would be devil spawn, and we didn't want to do that to ourselves. We thought, boy, we're just going to take this amazing blessing of this one awesome child 
and we're just going to sit tight right here. We're not, we're not going to move. We're not going to just, we're just going to stay there. And, um, I, I just remember being in the car and Mike and I being in the front seat and Seth's car seat would be in the back seat. And he could never just get, when we were together, um, he could never just get one of our attentions. He had to get both of our attentions. So he would always say, mom, and I'd say yes. And then he would say, dad, and Mike would say yes. And he then he would tell us whatever it was that, that we, um, that he wanted to tell us. But I remember one day looking at Michael and saying, you know, what did we ever do without the endless banter coming from that back seat? Like for nine years, it was just the two of us. It was two of us in the house, it was two of us at the business. It was the two of us. And we got to go and do and see and travel. And, and I have no regrets. I, I am a better parent because I'm a little bit of an older parent. I have no regrets about that, but I certainly would have not wanted to miss this journey of being a mom. And I'm, I'm grateful. And I was the mom that worked. So um, when Mike, well, Seth was about 14 months old and Mike lost his job. Um, he worked for a very big superstore and they had a big downsizing and they let 1900 managers go in one day. And Mike happened to be a product of that downsizing. And so we decided that it was going to be Mike who stayed home and that he was Mr. Mom. And I, we, we had the salon. He was going to help me with the salon. Um, at this point in time, we had moved. Our location was 3,000 square feet. I think we had 17 stylists, a massage therapist, a receptionist. So he was going to help me with the salon. But his primary role would be Seth's dad and Seth's caregiver. And he would take care of the house and he would do all of that. And then I would work in the salon. I worked a lot of long days. But I found for me... I was a better mom because I worked and my time with Seth was more quality than quantity. And so it, it doesn't necessarily work for any, you know, for everybody, but for me, I, that's, I was a really good mom in the, in that aspect. And Seth and I had our routine. So he and Mike would spend all day together. And then when I got home, it was my job to get Seth in his PJs and we'd sit down either in bed and we'd and snuggle or we'd sit downstairs and he and I would read a book together and I would put him to bed. And that was our nightly routine. And that worked for us. And I was so grateful that I had that. I was grateful that we, we were able to have that relationship and that we were in a position that Mike could stay home and be that. Now, looking back on that, um, I think about all of those times and those, you know, a little less than 15 years that Mike had with Seth. And I tell Seth all the time now, you know what, we had a concentrated dose of your dad because there are many kids that their dads work nine to five and they only see them after five o'clock and on the weekends where we had a very, very, very concentrated dose of Mike. We were able to go, the three of us just went together all the time. When, when we decided only to have one child, we did that on purpose. Mike and I loved spending time together. I, I always said the, the nucleus of the family is the marriage and granted our marriage wasn't perfect by any means. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's marriage is perfect, but, but we had a really, really, really good marriage. And we loved when our arguments occurred in our marriage, when we didn't spend enough time together, most people, like when they spend too much time together, that's when they argue. That wasn't us. When we spent not enough time together, that seems like when our arguments occurred. So we loved being together. And so the fact that Mike was free from a nine to five job and I had some flexibility because of being the owner for the business. So when we would travel or go places for Hello Gorgeous, the three of us just went together as a unit. And so I'm so grateful to have had all of that time together. And as I said, I, I told Mike all the time, I said, we had, or told Seth all the time that we had a very concentrated dose of his dad. And Mike and Seth were able to make some pretty incredible memories too. They had their routine down where Mike would make Seth, you know, breakfast in the morning and then they would have lunch. And right after lunch, they would have a pillow fight. And Seth always knew that it was time for a pillow fight because he would go and grab the pillow off the couch and toddle into the kitchen where Mike was cleaning up after lunch. And he would just be dragging a pillow with him to let his dad know that he had not forgotten that it was pillow fight time. So they really had um, some great memories and we're so grateful for all that time together and that it's molded Seth into the man that he is today. And there's so many memories that I'm grateful for, some of the trips and all of the holidays, but one memory in particular was I'd always wanted to surprise Seth with a trip to Disney. And I, um, I, wanted, to, I wanted to make sure that we... Um, that we were just able to pull that off. I, I had heard all of these stories about people that had, 
you know, packed their kids' luggage and not told the kids where they were going. And, and all of a sudden, you know, they tell the kids, we're going to Disney World. And so we were able to pull that off. I think Seth was um, 12. Uh, I believe he was 12. And um, we had Seth convinced that they were taking me to the airport because I had a trip to go on. And um, I asked him if I could borrow his backpack because I needed some um, extra room that I was going to a hair show and that I was, I, w- I had two different suitcases with me because I was taking all of the stuff for the hair show and I had to take two different carry-ons because some of the stuff couldn't be packed. I mean, it was just the extravagance of the story that we told him, it just kept growing. And he believed it. He believed every word of it. So we had gone to dinner for his birthday and then the the ruse was that they were taking me to the airport and dropping me off. And so we get to the airport and um, we got it all on tape where we told Seth, we're like, well, mom's not the only one that's going on a trip. And we told him I was going to Iowa of all places. We thought, who would want to go to Iowa? People that live in Iowa love Iowa, but I don't know that many people vacation to Iowa. And so we told Seth that I had a hair show and that I was going to Iowa. And, um, And so then it was there at the airport where we got to tell him that we were going on vacation and that we were actually going to Disney World. And he looked at me and it was so funny. He goes, no business, no no speaking engagements, no hair shows. And I said, nope, it's just strictly seven days of just you and I and dad, and we're just going on vacation. And, you know, it was that point in time when he questioned that, that I didn't realize, like, how much we worked. We, we worked all the time. We, um, we just, because we loved our job, we loved what we did. And because of that, then we just took our job with us everywhere. And many times we would go on a, a trip for work and we would tack on a couple of extra days for vacation afterwards. But just to be able to have that memory of us being able just to take Seth and surprise Seth uh, on a trip that was just all about him. Again, looking back on that, that time was priceless. Not knowing what would come down the pike a few years later, I'm so grateful that we were able to have that and that we had those memories together. In 2017, we lost Michael. And um, again, as I said, that he was sick for a long time, about 20 years. And so Mike actually was sick when Seth was born. And so Seth doesn't know any different. He didn't know his dad not to have tubes hanging out of his body um, that were, they were, they worked as bile ducts. He didn't know his dad. It was just, you know, commonplace for us to have to run to the emergency room or spend holidays at the emergency room. I, I, he just didn't, he didn't know any different. But I remember Seth standing outside his dad's hospital room door and telling him goodbye. I remember that child standing out there and um, just telling his dad that he was going to take care of me, that he would um, he would just make sure that mom was taken care of. And I thought, you know, at that point in time, you could really tell all of the goodness that Mike had poured into Seth as a book had come out of him that day for the strength of that 15 year old. Actually, Seth turned 15 on um, a Saturday and his dad passed away that following Monday. So um, Mike waited, didn't obviously didn't want to pass away on his son's birthday. That's how much his son meant to him. And um, I just remember Seth, just the strength that it must have taken that 15 year old boy to stand outside that hospital room door. But I, I promised Mike that I would take care of Seth. And so one of the first things that we did was I went to see a child psychologist. I thought Mike had worked so hard to uh, make this incredible young man. The last thing I wanted to do was screw him up. And I knew that Mike would haunt me forever had I screwed up our son. So we went to see a child psychologist and I wanted Seth to have a safe place that if he needed to talk to somebody or he couldn't necessarily talk to me or didn't feel like he could talk to a family member, that he had a place that he could go. And so we went um, every other week for the cup, the first couple of months. And then it was just once a month. And actually, I remember at the six month mark, the child psychologist looked at me and he goes, you don't need me. He said that you guys, you guys are fine. He said, everything that is in your son is already in there. It's already been formed in him and being bad or going off of the deep end is it doesn't resonate with him. If something like that would actually be introduced to him, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't want any part of it because it just doesn't sit well with him. And he said, I'm here if you need me, but you guys don't need me anymore. I remember we took Seth to some grief counseling and it was in groups. 
And I think he realized how lucky he was in sitting there and listening to some of the other teenagers that were struggling with the loss of a friend or a grandparent or a parent. And um, he went to a couple of those, two or three of those, and then he just said, Mom, you know, I'm okay. I, I don't need those anymore. And I said, okay, but, you know, we just needed to try those things. We wanted to make sure that, that, we, were, that we were all okay. But now that I'm a single parent, it's certainly nothing that I ever wanted to be. I remember Seth was just getting ready to enter his freshman year when Mike passed away. And I thought to myself, how can I do this? And so after Mike passed away, I came up with a two-prong approach. One was to make sure that our organization, Hello Gorgeous, stayed up and running. And the other one was to make sure that our son had a stellar high school career. Whatever that looked like, whatever we needed to do, I wanted to make sure that he had a stellar high school career. And so um, I was so grateful. I questioned the decisions that I made, hoping that I was making the best one for myself and my son. And this week I received a phone call from the Dean of Students from my son's high school. And he wanted to share with me that my son was winning an award. And um, it's a surprise to my son, but by the time this episode airs, uh, he will have already gotten the award. And so when the Dean of Students called, I, my, I jokingly said, are you telling me that my kids got a detention? And he said, no, that is some of the phone calls I have to make or that you know they're sick or whatever he said. But no, he said, I wanna tell you that they bestow this honor. Um, it's called the Senior of the Month and they choose one senior a month and um, it's, it's just this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful honor. And this is the very first award that they're giving to the class of 2021. And my son is getting that award. And I remember crying when I heard those words of your son is getting the award. And my sister came to me and said, why do you cry? You know, when you hear those good things. And I thought, you know, I fought so hard to make sure that Seth would be okay. And I know that he's a good kid, but to see somebody else witness the goodness that he has in him, it just, it brought tears to my eyes to know we're doing okay and we're making Mike proud. And that's, that's, that's what it's all about is honoring Michael in every way. So the three things, the three suggestions that I would have for you that I found to be very helpful when working as a solo parent is number one is if you make it a big deal, it's a big deal. Don't make it a big deal. Whatever it is, it needs to be addressed. It needs to be talked about. But the more excited that you get, the worse it can be. So last November, I was diagnosed with cancer. It was, um, it's a neuroendocrine cancer that's in my colon. And I had to have surgery. And so to sit down and talk to my son now and tell him that his only remaining parent has to have surgery because of cancer was not easy to do. But we didn't make it a big deal. And we didn't give him all the information at one time. We told him, hey, um, I had a colonoscopy, they found something, I've got to have surgery. And then once it came back that it was cancer, but we knew they got it all, we only gave him the information that he needed in the time that he needed it. We didn't overwhelm him, but we also didn't make it a big deal. So if you make it a big deal, it's a big deal. Don't make it a big deal. The second thing is, is celebrate all of the good things and address the not so good things. So if you have to address something that's not so good, obviously we have to have those hard talks, those hard conversations about things that aren't going the right way, but just don't overdo it, address them, but really, really, really celebrate all of the good things because it makes them want to do more good. And the third thing is a rule that I learned from my father-in-law when I first married into the family. And he said, nobody's ever raised their kids right and you aren't going to be the first one. Our kids don't want us to be perfect parents. They just want us to be present parents. So just remember that. Ease up on yourself. Nobody's ever raised their kids right, and you're not going to be the first one. We're almost out of time today. I want to say thank you so much for joining me, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode or want to learn more about Hello Gorgeous, you can check out our website at www.hellogorgeous.org or email me at kbecker at hellogorgeous.org. We invite you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or download our mobile app. Thank you for joining me today on Hello Gorgeous, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration. I'm your host, Kim Becker, and until next time, stay gorgeous. Another beautiful day, walking in the sunshine, spending the time with you. Last night we had a good time Dancing in the moonlight And loving the night away 
can't imagine what it'd be like. I can't imagine what it'd be like. I can't imagine what it'd be like without you. I can't imagine that. I remember.